Thank you very much, Nadav. I think uh, what's particularly interesting about uh, Nadav's talk is we often forget uh, how interrelated these cybersecurity and physical security sides have become. Uh, and I think that obviously somebody who gets up every morning and goes to work and is faced with that reality is probably reminded of that continuously. Uh, so I definitely thought that that was something uh, eye-opening, worth thinking about, I think, uh, in the battle to keep our citizens safe regardless of what country or countries we happen to be located in. Uh, it's often important to remember how useful having both cyber and physical working together can be. Uh, so thank you, Nadav. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Ian Levy, Technical Director of the National Cybersecurity Center in the United Kingdom. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Levy to the stage. Try again. Morning. Thank you. Um, this is probably not going to be your standard government cybersecurity presentation. You can probably tell from the title. Um, there's a point to that, which I will come back to. Um, so for those that didn't see my boss Kieran talk yesterday, the National Cybersecurity Centre in the UK is the single point of authority for cyber in the UK. So we've brought all the different organisations together into one new organisation um, to try and do a bit better. I'm going to talk a bit about what we're doing. But first of all, I want to ask you a question. Anybody know the answer? So you look around in life, every window you see is square, apart from windows on aeroplanes. Anybody know why? Hands up. Sir. I can't hear you, so I'm just going to agree that you said the right thing. 1950, um, three de Havilland Comet 1s exploded in midair. That's a bad thing for an aeroplane to do. Um, Eventually, in Italy, they found some of the wreckage and found that there were diagonal stress fractures at the corners of the windows. And retrospectively, you go, oh, of course, it's Route 2 as much stress, and it pops, ah, oh, damn it, how did we not see that? What do you do? So you've now got a system with a fielded vulnerability, right? Aircraft industry takes a de Havilland Comet wing, sticks it in a big tank, and fills it with water and drains it 1,500 times to simulate the cycle count, and causally observes, oh look, cracks appear. Now what do you do? Because now you've proved the vulnerability. Well, in the aircraft industry, they go, I know what we'll do. We won't build aircraft with square windows anymore. That's a good start. And we'll put extra monitoring in place, we'll put buttresses on the diagonals, and we can make the system safe by reducing the harm. What do you do in cyber? If it was the same thing, you'd give it a really cool code name like Certain Death and run around panicking, saying that everybody was going to die the moment they got on a plane. We have a language problem. If you do what the aircraft industry does, you can go and do this. This is a graph from the FAA. I call it the chance of dying when you get on a plane graph. They call it something better than that. Broadly speaking, and this is broadly speaking, what this says is, in 1970, if you got on a plane, you were relatively likely to be in an accident. And if you were, you were relatively unlikely to survive. By 2005, by following a harm reduction strategy, if you got on a plane in 2005, you're relatively unlikely to be in an accident. And if you are, you're relatively likely to survive. That's harm reduction, not vulnerability reduction. And I think that's what we should be doing in cyber. We should be working about reducing harm of attack, not panicking about vulnerabilities. This is the first public exposition of a buffer overflow I can find. Right? It's from 1972. So in 1972, the first time somebody said buffer overflows are a security problem. Heartbleed. April 2014, 42 years later, it's the same software defect. If we can't fix buffer overflows in 42 years, I think we should probably stop trying and do something else. That strategy is not working. Everybody in the room knows two things about hackers, right? They wear hoodies, and they are surrounded by strange green Java. <laughs> I think this is the real problem in cyber. 
So we call things advanced persistent threats, right? And we, cyber is the only part of public policy where there's no independent data. It's the only part of public policy where the, the public's view of what's going on is driven by a massively incentivized group of people, the security industry, right? And it's incentivized to make it sound like these, these um, attacks are purported by winged ninja cyber monkeys in China or Russia who can compromise a machine just by thinking about it. That's not true. They're bound by the laws of physics, but it drives a weird response. Back in medieval England, <coughs> excuse me, back in medieval England, um, if you got a weird rash on your leg, you'd go to the wise woman in the village. You'd go to the wise woman and you'd buy a magic amulet from her. And one of two things would happen. The rash would go away and you'd get better, in which case the magic amulet was awesome, or you'd die, in which case you didn't buy a big enough magic amulet. That's where we are in cybersecurity today. If we allow people to talk like that, it drives a fear. Oh, this is a two XKCD presentation, by the way. There are two XKCD, who reads XKCD? Oh, the rest of you, you really have to start reading XKCD, it's awesome. So what we've got at the moment is a fear response that goes, I don't really understand what's going on, I don't really understand what the problem is, but this guy over here says if I pay him some money, I, he can fix it for me. Right? When XKCD are making jokes about how cyber is deployed, I think we've got a problem. That's what we actually see. The actual name for most of the attackers, they're not advanced persistent threats, they are adequate pernicious toe rags. They are adequate because they only do the minimum necessary and we don't make it very hard for them. Right? Do not confuse technical sophistication with level of impact, they are totally different things. If we are honest about how most of these attacks work, if we are honest about the technical capabilities that most of the attackers use, we can do something about it. We can change the conversation so it's much more about risk management and much less about hype and emotion. This is an awesome document. Um, this is the new national cybersecurity strategy for the UK. Um, I got into trouble for saying last time that it was not completely crap. Right, for a government document, it's actually pretty good. It's 80 pages, and it talks about what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about one strand of what's in there, um, but it's a much more interventionist strategy. We've said instead of sitting for 10 years, which is what we've done, going, you should all do better, and you should all share information, which provably doesn't work, we're going to actually go and do something. So I'm going to talk about one strand of our strategy. It covers everything. It covers skills, it covers making the economy better, it covers offensive cyber, and it covers what I'm going to talk about, which is active defense. Um, before I do, all of these attacks, we give people advice. Again, this is my second XKCD, XKCD cartoon, which is security advice. Can everybody read them? There are some of my favorites on here. So my favorite is um, use a two-factor smoke detector. Always use prime numbers in your passwords. Change your maiden name regularly. I think that one's awesome. Right. We give bad advice. Here's my favorite piece of bad advice. Right. Hands up if you've been told, don't click a link or open an attachment in an email unless you trust the source of the email. Hands up, everybody's got to put your hands up, come on. Stay awake, it's not that bad. It's really, really, really dumb. How do you trust an email? Hands up if you know how to garner trust in an email. So there's got to be somebody who knows how to read internet headers. Come on. Somebody must be able to do it. I reckon I can do it about 90% of the time. Right, do you want to see what it looks like? This is for one message between me and somebody else that went, thanks. They're the headers. Go for it. Knock yourselves out. See if you can work out if that's a trustworthy message or not. Right, that piece of advice is monumentally stupid because the average person cannot do it. And so it, it just reinforces this fear response. So how about we do something else? Everybody, hands up if you know about DMARC, anybody? So it's a protocol that allows a domain owner to take control about who can send email from that domain. These are two DMARC records we've put up. So the first one basically says, if anybody tries to send email from at gov.uk, don't deliver it to the end user, deliver it to me instead. Right, so these are spoofs. On the first day we turned that on, we got 58,000 spoof emails. 
not delivered to the end users, delivered to us. All of them were from taxrefund.gov.uk. On the second day, we got about 58,000. On the third day, we got four, all different. On the fourth day, about 58,000. And then from then on, zero. They've gone somewhere else because those spoof emails are not being delivered to their victims. The second one is Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is our tax authority, which is the most fished brand in the UK. 300 million emails will not, spoofed emails will not be delivered because of that one DNS entry. That's pretty awesome. Let's talk about harm reduction. So we've been doing some experiments. Um, doing three things. If you spot phishing anywhere in the UK, physically hosted in the UK, we'll go take it down. And by take it down, I mean email the hosting provider saying, hey, you're hosting phishing, please stop it. If there's a web inject in a piece of UK infrastructure, we'll go take that down. And then anything government branded anywhere in the world, we'll go after that too. And you can see the numbers. So before we started, phishing in the UK, a phishing site physically hosted in the UK would last about a day. Now it's about 45 minutes. That's harm reduction. The chance of somebody clicking the link doesn't change. The chance of them being harmed when they do, does. Right, if you approach this in a different way, you can have simple things can have a big effect. Recursive DNS is my friend. So we're building, we have built, sorry, a public sector scale DNS. So all of public sector in the UK will use our DNS service. And if you, if you try and resolve something that is bad, you don't get to go there. It also generates huge amounts of data about what government's doing, what government systems are doing, what they're trying to contact and why. And so we can start to build data at government scale to say, this is what the world looks like. It's part of this program called the Active Cyber Defense Program. This is all on our website. You can go to ncse.gov.uk and read about this. But there's some interesting things there. Um, at the bottom is that DNS system. We scale by doing other things. So this isn't about protecting government, this is about protecting the UK. All of this is do it to government first and then scale it out. An interesting one there is the left-hand side, the internet service providers. We've had conversations with them that say, hey guys, it's probably not okay that your customers can hurt themselves without knowing. How about you protect them by default? And if you need data, you can have ours for free. If you don't need data from us, that's great. But how about we just protect people by default? Those are the sorts of national scale things that you can do if you start to look at the problem in a different way and you're honest about how some of these attacks work. Our scaling strategy is really, really simple. It's point and laugh. So let's say we get DMARC on every government system by the end of the year. I can then point at all the other sectors, the retail sector, the banking sector, and go, hey guys, look, we're stupid, we're government, we could do it. How about you guys do it too? And because all of this data is public, I can generate it, I can analyze it, and I can make uh, evidence out of it in public and help people make better investment decisions. So we're going to do more of this and less of this because this one works, and this one doesn't. The end of the strategy is all about this. It's about moving the conversation in the UK from fear, which is what it is today, to published evidence and analysis in public, transparently. If you want to change how cybersecurity is done globally, change how you talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That was fantastic. What, uh, what Ian basically, what I took from Ian's talk was uh, basically that the data says I'm too dumb to be trusted and I need people like Ian to help me understand uh, how the systems can prevent me from getting into trouble. Uh, so that was a very interesting talk. You know, one thing I noticed yesterday, I arrived right around lunchtime, the middle of the day. Um, I didn't manage to get lunch, as I'm sure uh, many of you also waited quite a while, didn't manage to get lunch. But it made me think about how much this conference has grown. Uh, this is my fourth year up on the stage here uh, in a row, and each year the conference has gotten not only larger, but has included a more and more relevant crowd. Each year, the networking, the crowd that's attracted, the attendees, the speakers, are more and more relevant and involved in uh, many of the critical issues that we as a security community are dealing with on a regular basis. Uh, so it's really quite a pleasure to be here. Um, our next speaker is, is also a repeat speaker. He's been here in the past. Uh, he's someone who I've known for a long time, since my days when I lived in the US. Um, and despite the fact that he's known me for a while, he agreed to speak on the panel that I'm chairing. 
So I do appreciate that. Ian's right, tough crowd. That's all right. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up our next speaker, Dr. Douglas Mon, Director of the Cybersecurity Division, Science and Technology Directorate, Department of Homeland Security, United States. <laughs> 